we're going to look here at different issues that we can come across while motion tracking. And one of the biggest issues that we find is reflections in the surfaces that we're tracking. So here we could do a planar track on this floor because it's a flat surface and Mocha is great for that. Makes it super fast and easy to track. But the issue we have here is the fact that we see these reflections in the ground that are going to mess up our track because our track is going to look at the reflections and incorporate that data into our planar track. And it's going to give us a sliding track, which is not what we want. It's going to be sliding off of the actual floor. So the way that we can go about fixing this is shooting from an angle that doesn't produce reflections. So if we shoot from the opposite direction here, we can see that we no longer have the reflections and we're tracking the front part here of the shot. So always keep reflections in mind when setting up a shot that you know will require motion tracking. We also want to be mindful of motion blur. So motion blur is something that happens when there's motion in the shot and your shutter speed is at a rate that allows for motion blur. So depending on how fast your camera or your subject in the shot is moving, you may require a higher shutter speed. So this shot here was done at a shutter speed of one over 30. So it's pretty much the lowest shutter speed that you can shoot at. And as a result, you're gonna see a lot of motion blur, especially in a shot that's moving as fast as this one. So as the camera shot moves up, we can see that there's a lot of motion blur and the motion blur blurs the pixels in our shot. So it makes it more difficult for our motion tracking programs, whether that be After Effects or Mocha or any number of other motion tracking programs to read the data because the pixels are blurred. So the way that we can avoid motion blur, especially when we know that we're going to be shooting subjects that are moving fast or the camera is going to be moving fast is to up the shutter speed. So this shot here was shot at a shutter speed of one over 500. And we can see that the pixels in every frame are clear. And uh, let's look at this other example here where we have an even faster panning shot. As the camera pans up, we can see a ton of motion blur here as we scrub through these frames. And the way to avoid that, of course, is to up the shutter speed in your camera. And you can look up ways to do that if you don't know how to adjust your shutter speed. But we can see here as we move up that every frame is clear and that's gonna allow our program to motion track much more efficiently. And we're gonna be able to avoid doing any manual tracking because the program can actually read the pixels. The next issue that we might run into is a shallow depth of field. If we're shooting something up super close, this was shot on a 50 millimeter lens. And so it's relatively shallow and we shot it at an F 1.8 F stop, which if you don't know what that means, you can look it up, look into different aperture settings on cameras, but basically the smaller the F stop, the more shallow your depth of field will be. And the depth of field is defined as the area of our scene that's in focus. And so we can see here that the front of this chandelier is in focus but the back isn't because our depth of field is so shallow. And it's going to make it difficult to track because when we have pixels blurred, there's less of a contrast and it's more difficult for our motion tracking program to read the pixels, especially if we're not using Mocha. Mocha does a pretty good job at it, but if we're using something other than Mocha, then it's gonna be more difficult to track if we're using a shallow depth of field. So the way we can avoid that is to bump up our f-stop. And so that's our aperture. If we, here we bumped up the aperture all the way up to eight and we shot it a little bit wider. And so you can see that there's a lot more focus in this shot and it's gonna be a lot easier to track because we have bumped up the f-stop and made it a little bit wider on our focal length. Here we have a shot where we obviously can't track because we have the issue of reflection and moving water is going to be nearly impossible to motion track. So what we can do is shoot it from a slightly different angle and actually use the tiles to track and then use that data to apply 
motion tracking to the pool. So we're using surrounding data to solve for water, which would normally be untrackable. And if we wanted to add some sort of meteor crashing into this pool, we could motion track that water by simply motion tracking the surrounding tiles and then applying that tracking data to the pool. Another thing we want to look at is what's called sufficient positives. And positives are points that we can actually use to track. So it could be literal points or often you see tracking X's because X's work great for tracking onto, or we could just use any sort of pattern for motion tracking. So here we're going to try and track on a shirt. We can see that Zach's shirt here is completely blank. So it would, it's going to be difficult to track this shot. We would use Mocha for a shot like this, but because there's no information on Zach's shirt, we're going to have a bad track. Instead, we want to shoot a t-shirt that has some pattern on it. So you can see here that John's shirt has pattern on it and we get a much better track because of that pattern. Another thing you want to watch out for changes in light. So here we can see that we have the sun glare that comes over the roof and obviously the sun glare adds light and it changes our pixels in the shot. So even though we're not tracking the sun, the sun is affecting part of the roof and we get a terrible track from that sun. The way to fix that is to shoot from a different angle where we don't have sun or to put the sun in later, or we could just frame the shot so that the sun isn't affecting the part of our shot that we want tracked. One thing we want to be mindful also, especially when shooting on DSLRs, is rolling shutter. So we can see that if we go frame by frame on the shot, that we have this sort of warping of the shot. It looks like it's slanted. You could Google rolling shutter to find out exactly why that happens, but Obviously, this isn't how the room looks in reality, and so if we were to use a program like After Effects or PF Track or Buju to track this, we would have some issues because it would be thinking that our world is slanted when in reality it's not, and it's going to mess up our track because the world goes from being slanted to not being slanted when the camera stops. So Mocha is a great program for this because it can read that rolling shutter. But ways to get around this would be to remove the slanting in post. Their After Effects CS6 has a plugin that we can use to compensate for the rolling shutter. Or we could just shoot the shot much slower or we could shoot it on a camera that doesn't have a rolling shutter. Something that we want to be mindful of when filming on set is the focal length that we're shooting at. Different focal lengths are going to have different lens distortions. So the wider that we shoot, the more distorted the image is going to be. A wider lens like this, for example, was shot on a 16 millimeter lens. And although you may not notice it at first, we can see that the lens distorts our shot to almost a fisheye type of effect. And because it's distorted, it's not it's not actually representative of reality and how things are in reality. And our tracking software is made to work with reality. Our program isn't going to know that we have a lens distortion unless we tell it or we undistort our footage. So in After Effects, we can use software to undistort our footage. And I'm going to give you a quick tutorial here if you click on this link on how we can go about measuring the distortion in our shots and then compensating for that distortion. But it's very important that you solve for distortion because so often lens distortion can mess up your shot. The ways to compensate for lens distortion are to either undistort the, the shot, tell the software if it allows you to that the shot is distorted, or you can just shoot with a focal length that isn't distorted. Once you get to 35 millimeter, your shot is relatively undistorted and you don't have to worry about it. But if you're shooting anything less than 35 millimeters on your lens, then you're gonna want to make sure that you're compensating for that lens distortion in some way. And so you can see this shot here that was shot on 35 millimeter. There's almost no distortion in the shot. And this shot, it's easy to track, although it doesn't look as epic. So often I do like to shoot things with a wider angle, but I do need to be mindful of the issues that it could bring in post and make sure that I compensate for those issues. 
So one of the biggest issues that we have with tracking is what we call false positives. And false positives are points in our track that our computer reads as actual positions in reality when in fact they aren't. So for example, the reflections that we could see here on the piano, if our software was to track these points, it would create what we call a false positive because the computer thinks that these points of contrast are real positions in real life when in fact they aren't, they're just reflections. And so we need to tell the computer to ignore these false positives in order to get an accurate track. Another thing we have to worry about are intersecting points on things like this window, for example. We have this cross in this window, which is an actual position in the middle of that cross. But when it intersects with the background, because we can see through the windows, and we see this issue often with windows because you can see through the windows, we are going to see points where the window line here intersects with the background tree. And the computer sees that point of contrast and thinks that it's an actual position point. But it's actually not, it's not a real point position, it's just an intersection of the two. So we want to make sure that we tell the computer to ignore those positions. I'm gonna go here in After Effects and show you an example. We use the camera tracker here in After Effects to automatically track the shot, and we can see that if we don't delete any of the points that it originally created, it's going to use a lot of these false positives to solve, and our solve's gonna be fairly inaccurate because of these false positives. So what we need to do is actually go into the camera tracker and delete all of these false positives. It can be kind of a tedious task, especially if it's picking up a lot of false positives, but it pays off in the end because you're gonna get a much more accurate track. So I went through most of these frames and I didn't do a perfect job, but I did a pretty good job and I deleted all of the false positives that were obvious to me. And we can see here intersections from Zach's leg in the background, reflections on the piano, intersections between the window and the background. And then we can see that after I deleted these false positives, we can see that the track is much more accurate and the end result is better. So make sure that you are mindful of the false positives in your shot and that you delete them when you're doing your motion tracking. One thing we want to be mindful of when setting up a shot is the parallax in the shot. And so parallax is the shift in objects that are at different Z depths from our perspective. So if you were to take both of your hands and put them at different distances from your face and then move your head, you would see a shift in distance between both of your fingers. And that's what we call parallax. And so parallax is great for motion tracking because it allows our tracking software to know where the camera is and how it's moving because of that shift in parallax. And so when we're shooting things like green screen back plates, for example, we want to set up things so that the camera can read the parallax in the shot. Sometimes our shots naturally include parallax, but sometimes we need to add it ourselves. So for example, this shot where we can see this awesome effect of the card moving around, um, we want to help our computer out by adding parallax into the shot so that our camera can accurately read how the object or scene is moving. So for this shot, we added some markers to this cooler and had Zach move it around and we can see a shift in parallax between the dots that are closer and further away from us because the cooler has a certain amount of depth to it. So we're gonna see that parallax. If we only had trackers on the back wall of this cooler and not on the front, then we wouldn't see a shift in parallax or at least not a great as great of one because all of the dots are on the same plane. So we wanna make sure that our parallax trackers are on different planes closer and further away from the camera so that we can get an accurate track. 